Journey Church, how's everybody doing today? You don't sound very excited. That was a wonderful worship experience earlier. Is that all you got out there today? Hey, if we haven't met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey, and there was an uncommon anointing in this place this morning. Did you feel it? Did you sense God's presence in this place? Maybe not. Maybe I was in the wrong place. I mean, y'all... Did, did God just, the devil just quiet y'all up or something like that? You know, you got to talk back to me. You got to make it worth it up in here today, you know. We're in this series that we kicked off last week called Activate. It's about the gifts of the Spirit, right? And you know that we find ourselves in a spiritual war, and I think the devil has done all he can to discount this particular topic. No offense, Adam, I think the thing going on at Lake Asbury is absolutely awesome, but as a father in the house, I will also say that you do not need to be shy about the gifts of the Spirit. The world is out there getting pretty weird right now. I don't know if any of you saw any of the videos from the Grammys or anything this past weekend with that performance by Sam Smith and whoever that was and whatever it was, but the devil's out there on full display. It's time for the church to get a little bit weird if we need to in Jesus' name, right? Because sometimes when God shows up, some amazing, wonderful, incredible things happen. And there's nothing wrong with desiring spiritual gifts. How many of y'all like to get gifts at Christmas? Just me? I like to get gifts. I like to give gifts too, right? And the Holy Spirit is a giver of gifts. And in fact, this series is really based out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And if you look at verse 31, it says this, earnestly desire the greater gifts earnestly desire the greater gifts. Yet the devil has done an amazing job with propaganda to get us to discount and even forget that the gifts of the Holy Spirit exist. He's very content with Christians operating in the fruits of the Spirit. That is an absolutely wonderful good thing. You should not have the gifts of the Spirit without the fruits of the Spirit. That's why we did that series first, right? Because if you have the gifts and you don't have the fruit, then guess what? You're just a fruit loop. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> You need a little bit of both right there, right? You need a little bit of both to balance that out, to express the love of God through the gifts of the Spirit and through the fruits of the Spirit. But we want to talk a little bit today about how the devil does deceive us and trick us into believing that these things aren't true. But let me tell you, they are true, and God wants to use you to go out there and make a difference in the lives of others. Can I get an amen for that one, right? God wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of others. Somehow... The devils tricked us into believing that we can only have faith to believe that God can save us. A very important thing, would you agree? We need to have faith to believe that God can save us, but for some reason we lack the faith to believe that God can do the miraculous through us or for us. I'm praying we'll overcome that fear today. Lord, we praise you and give you glory today. You are the king of the universe and we love you. Would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and the power to put your word into practice today? Would you touch our hearts and our minds? Would you give us this gift of faith that we're about to talk about? That we'd have faith to believe you for our salvation. We'd have faith to believe you for the miraculous. We'd have faith to believe that you are still at work in our generation and that one day you will come back and judge all of humanity. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you glory today in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. amen. So there's really two types of faith that I want to talk about today. There's saving faith, say saving faith, saving faith. and miraculous faith miraculous faith. God wants us to believe both. He says, believe me, earnestly desire. That means go for it with everything within you. Believe God for the greater things. He wants to give you that gift, but it's something that you have to desire. It's something that you have to want in your life. And the devil, as I said, does everything he can to suppress us from believing that those gifts are possible to be at work in our lives. So saving faith is ultimately a prerequisite for miraculous faith. You need to be saved, right? That's an important part, which has to do with what he shared earlier. That means you have to repent. You have to be sorrowful over your sins and you have to run from them and turn from them and go in a different direction. Holiness matters, does it not? Holiness really matters. 
It's a prerequisite for miraculous faith. So where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, or some versions say from the word of God, right? So how does faith begin to take root in your life? It becomes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. You all are listening to this word today. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, faith comes from the spoken word of God. Faith comes from reading the word of God. Those are some of the prerequisites. That's how your faith begins to get built. So people get saved when the word of God is spoken. And then they respond, right? But the very gift of that response is a gift from God. Hebrews 11.1 defines faith as, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is hope with a conviction. How many of you have ever seen Jesus with your eyes? Nobody's raising their hand. One or two. Come on. Come on, Jesus. A couple of us, right? Most of us have not, but we have faith to believe that he saved us. We believe that he really was born of a virgin, right? That he lived a spotless, sinless life. That he was crucified on our behalf and that he rose again. I believe that with all my heart deep within me. I didn't have to see it with my eyes, but somewhere deep down, I know that to be true. I know my life has changed because of that event that happened some 2,000 years ago. Faith is hope with conviction. While we can see it, while we can't necessarily see it with our eyes, we can feel it deep within us. And when activated, incredible things begin to happen. Dead things things literally come alive. Ephesians 2.1, and you, he's talking about us, our former selves before we got saved, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked, right? A precondition, something we no longer do as believers. Remember I said that holiness matters? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by very nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I don't know if you like to think of yourself that way, but when you, before you were a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you were an enemy with God. Your spirit was dead. It was destined for an eternity apart from God. You were heading in the direction of hell, whether you were like Sam Smith up there openly worshiping the devil in front of millions of people, or you were living in secrecy, still your spirit was dead. Do you get that? I've never seen in the natural a dead thing come back to life. In fact, it can't by the very nature of the definition, right? It needs a miracle, a supernatural injection of a force outside of itself in order for it to come alive. So you could get that picture. I had heart surgery a couple years ago. Thankfully, they didn't have to zap me with that stuff. But you've all had that picture in your mind, right? You are dead. The person's flatlined. They come in and they zap them. And then all of a sudden, life comes again, right? Life comes again. So your spirits are dead. The first and greatest miracle of all time is that you got saved. You were destined for hell and now you're on the path to heaven. You were saved by Jesus. He took out those charging things and zapped you back to life. Your spirit that once was dead is now alive in Christ. That's why once you're a believer, when you hear about those old things in life that he's talking about in that verse, they they run against our grain now. You know that when you sin, you're not doing the right thing because now your spirit is alive. Before that, you didn't care. I never had had the desire to go to church on a Sunday morning prior to getting saved. It just wasn't part of my DNA. It wasn't part of who I was. We went there out of obligation, as some do, and then God had an intervention that day, right? God showed up in that place, and he changed my destiny. And then you couldn't keep me from church for the next 25 years, right? Before that, I never wanted to go. And then all of a sudden, something different happened in my life. You and I were literally dead men and women walking. 
The only way that happens is when a dead thing comes to life is when something supernatural occurs. Verse four, but God, say but God. God. Aren't you glad? Being rich in mercy because of the great love for which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works so that no man can boast. You can't earn your way into heaven, can you? You can't do it. It says it's a free gift of God. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, right? God gives you the gift of faith. You didn't have it. You were dead. He ignites your spirit supernaturally and causes you, believe it or not, to say, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life. I thank you for the free gift of your salvation. Come inside of me and change me and transform me. I repent of my sins. I no longer want to live for the world. I want to live for you from this moment forward and forevermore. I can't wait to spend eternity with you in heaven. At one time, I bet almost everybody in this room said that. You said that. How amazing is that? God gave you that gift. It ignited in your heart, and you responded to his grace, his goodness, his kindness, and his mercy. But guess what? You were dead. And like Lazarus, he said, come forth, Lazarus, from the dead. And the grave clothes fell off of you, and you are now alive in Christ. Would you give him just a little bit of glory? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what does that inward gift look like to an outsider? Romans 10, 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Probably one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, right? With your mouth, you confess. So how is faith activated? Through your mouth. You got to speak it out loud. Jesus, will you save me? Jesus, will you transform me? Jesus, I repent. Sure, you could say it in your heart, but I'm telling you it's more powerful when it comes out of your mouth. Why do you think we ask you when you get saved to come up front and speak it to somebody else? Because when you speak it out of your mouth, it comes alive. God spoke the world into existence by faith, right? He spoke and the earth became. He spoke and bones were formed and flesh was formed and he breathed breath and life into it. You got to speak to your enemies and tell them to shut up in Jesus' name, right? You got to walk forward and let it out of your mouth. So you say, Eric, how do we know somebody really got saved? See, a lot of people come up to the altars and confess and believe, and then they walk away. What happens? I would attest to you that the Christian should begin to bear fruit in accordance with their salvation. So you're not saved simply by walking up here and praying a prayer. Some simple prayer doesn't necessarily 100% do the saving. When you go and your life is changed, then you're saved. If you're still calling yourself a Christian and you live like hell, you're probably not a Christian. Because it doesn't line up. Did you read Ephesians chapter 2 that we just read a moment ago? This was your former life. This is how you behaved before. Does that mean you won't have strongholds? Didn't say that, right? We still have strongholds. We have to overcome them. That's where we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to begin to come in. That we could speak against those things. Just like God did in Exodus through the mouth of Moses and said, let my people go. Guess what? They got trapped in the wilderness for 40 years. They were saved at that moment, right? But they struggled in their sinfulness for all those years because they were so used to living like slaves that they couldn't imagine any other life. 
That's why you got to get in the word. That's why you got to be around the word. That's why you got to get it deep within you because it builds your faith to believe that you can be an overcomer because the world's been speaking to you year after year after year after year saying that you won't amount to nothing that you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that every time you sin, he tries to question your salvation. He tells you that you can never be forgiven and you need to start telling him, devil, you are a liar in Jesus' name. I am an overcomer. I am forgiven. I will overcome. I serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm a child of God. But you can't go on sinning. You can't go on living with a lack of, of holiness in your life and call yourself a believer. That's a big problem in our generation. You know, you get people maybe even at the highest level of government that are espousing things for our country that are in direct opposition of the word of God and calling themselves Christians. No, we need to start calling some people out. That is not a believer in Jesus Christ. Yes, we will pray for you. Yes, we will honor you because of the position that you're in. Yes, we love God and we love you and want to see your soul saved. But you can't say certain things and enact certain laws that don't line up with God's word that question the very image of the creator of the universe. Because you and I are created in the image of God. The devil wants to destroy that, does he not? We need boldness in our generation. Yes, it is enough to get saved as many churches espouse. Praise God, praise God, praise God. But have you ever asked the question, is there more? There's more to life, more to Christianity. Christianity doesn't have to be boring. We find ourselves in a war. You are soldiers for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We don't have time for all the junk of the world. We're called to go out there and win souls for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lest I digress, I better come back to my notes. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believeth him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So a prerequisite for miraculous faith is saving faith, right? You got to be saved. Amen. Now, a lot of people don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. Why is that? Earlier, I shared Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. If you'll recall, I mentioned that we find ourselves in a spiritual war. I open up most of my messages in that way. It's a reminder because we don't always see it with our eyes. We have to understand by faith that there's a supernatural war going on in heavenly places that manifests itself here on earth. And it is said in war that the first casualty of war is the truth. The first casualty of war is the truth. And the devil has led an incredible propaganda campaign over the years, convincing Christians in our generation that the gifts of the Spirit no longer exist, that the gifts of the Spirit were only for the apostles, that we don't need them in our generation. But let me tell you something, when the dark gets darker, the light needs to get lighter. When the devil's out there parading in the way that he does, you think that the God himself would leave us defenseless? Why would he remove the very weapons of our warfare that we have at our disposal? The devil wants to get you going out into battle with no spiritual weapons. He wants to get you running out there naked. Come on, Jesus. That ain't going to happen. Hallelujah. We're going to have on the spiritual breastplate of armor and all that good stuff, right? But why do you think that so many Christians get divided over this? I remember very early on, and I think, I think in some circles it's changing, but... Um, I remember very early on, we were trying to do some things working with other churches, and one of the first questions that came out of somebody's mouth, do you guys believe in the gift of tongues? I'm like, yeah, we believe in the gift of tongues. We believe it should be manifested in decency and honor, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that that's one of the gifts, and it actually says you should earnestly desire the greater gift. So I'm going to believe God for all the gifts to be manifested. You know what that pastor said? Then we're not doing anything with you. Like, ooh. Why do you think the devil presses so hard to believe you that Christians can't have demons? Why do you think? Because if you don't believe that, then y'all keep getting stuck with demons in your life. You can't be owned by demons, but you certainly could still be harassed. You could certainly still invite them into your life. Christians have demons, let me tell you. I've seen it. Come on, Jesus. I've seen them go too in Jesus' name, right? Christians need deliverance. 
People need, why would you go, you take that verse 70 times seven or seven times seven, why would you go deliver an unbeliever from demons if you know that their next state is gonna be seven times worse than the first? That verse is directed at believers because then they get filled with the Holy Spirit and there's nowhere for the demons to come back in, right? So Christians, if you've bought the lie that you can't be demonized, today's the day where that lie needs to go by the wayside. Because if there's some habitual strongholds that continue to be present in your life, don't accept that it's just natural in nature or in the lives of others. You better address it on both, both fronts. So if it's a healing issue, you pray that God would heal in the natural, that he would bring every single one of those cells into perfect order. But also 90% of the time in the Bible, when someone was afflicted with a sickness, it was actually a demon in disguise. He cast out the demons. Where do you think all those demons went? They just disappeared over the years? No, I attest to you that in our generation, they're coming back with more rage than ever before because they know that the time is short. You think they would have been able to pull off that Grammy performance 50 years ago? No, our nation has invited them back in. They removed prayer from schools. They kicked God out of those circles. And now the demons are like, free for all, come on. We coming back in. First, we got you to have the sexual revolution in the 1960s. Then we got y'all to be dumb enough to kill all your babies in the 1970s. Now we can go out there and have you openly worship us in the 2020s. They're getting worse and worse. We need these weapons more than ever before. We got to stop getting trampled on as believers in Jesus Christ. And we need to start stepping on snakes and scorpions and kicking them out because the devil is a liar. It's in his best interest to try to keep us from the truth, right? He's created a generation that believes that verse that says, I have it in here somewhere, about denying the power thereof. Anybody know what that verse is? 2 Timothy 3, 5. He's raised up a generation of believers who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. You know what God says about that? Flee from them. He says flee from them. They don't know it, but they're teaching lies and they're leaving people defenseless. And that's why Christians are so beat up. It's time to overcome. God wants to do something right here, right now in this place to set some people free. A spiritual war rages on in heavenly places and we need every weapon at our disposal. The devil, this is how he works. Jesus describes it in the parable of the sower. How do you gain faith? We read it earlier, right? You do so by hearing and the hearing of the word of God. When you hear the word of God, when you read the word of God, it plants seeds in your heart. This parable of the sower talks about how the devil comes in various forms and he wants to pluck those seeds out of your life. He wants to cover them up with discouragement. He wants to rip them out with sin. He does anything he can to keep those faith seeds from taking root in your life, to keep you in the dark, to keep you from seeing God for who he is, for helping you to understand the power that really lies within you when you grasp this stuff because he's supposed to be on the retreat. Instead, he's on the advance because believers are walking around without these tools in their toolbox. But God wants to change that right here, right now, today. We are good soil in which God can sow. So the devil does everything he can to the saved person to keep you from being effective. See, once you're saved, he can't take your salvation, right? But he can do everything he can to keep you effective. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, there's one verse that I didn't read that was at the very end that says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when you get saved, he's got a job for you to do. And then the devil tries to do everything he can to keep you from doing that job. And oftentimes that job has to do with one or more of the gifts that are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 right? It's not just that you as a Christian have the gift of serving children in the rooms back there. That is super needed. Come on, Jesus, right? But you have supernatural gifts that are at your disposal and he doesn't want you to use them, right? He wants to keep you ineffective. He wants to keep you from knowing this stuff. Lord, help us. So if you find yourself at a place where you're struggling with the deeper things of faith, Here's the first prayer that I would have you pray. Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. 
Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Lord, I don't want to wander around like the children of Israel for 40 years where an entire generation has to die away before they could enter into the promised land. Lord, would you give me the power to take you at your word, to put it into practice in my life, to believe for things like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 31, that the greater things can be manifested in and through my life, not only for me, but to make a difference in the lives of others that we could see them be saved, that they could gain wisdom, that they could gain knowledge, that they could gain understanding, that they could see in the spirit, that they could speak in tongues, that people would be delivered, that people would be set free, that people would be healed. We need all of those things in our generation, right? There's this scene in Mark chapter nine where Jesus encounters a boy who is demonically possessed. The disciples prayed for him and the demons did not come out. Jesus seems a little frustrated in his response. Mark 9, 19, and he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. I wonder if he'd say the same thing in our generation. We look for every other opportunity. We see someone sick. We see somebody demon possessed. We'll be like, I ain't going to try to deliver that demon, man. Somebody else going to do that, not me. Let me go call that Catholic priest over there. He's going to be able to do it, right? Y'all seen the movies, right? That's how it works. No. Would we have the faith to believe? Jesus says, bring him to me. The demon just sees Jesus. The the demon don't even, Jesus don't even speak to the demon yet. And it, it flings the boy to the ground and he begins foaming at the mouth. Just at the sight of Jesus. Jesus didn't even say a word yet. Jesus asks his father, how long has this been happening? And the father says, since childhood. And then he begs him to help him. In Mark 9, 23, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Lord, help us as a generation to believe these words that we're speaking today, that they're true that we would overcome the lies of the evil one who's kept us in the dark for so long. Say this with me, all things are possible. possible. Say it a little louder. One more time. Lord, would we activate our faith by our words today? So let me just share a couple very practical things that I'd love to pray for you. So how do we build our faith very practically? Let me combine a couple of thoughts here. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So if you want to strengthen your faith, the first thing I would encourage you to do is read the word of God on a regular basis. Is your Bible catching dust up at your house? (laughs) If it is, then I wouldn't expect you to be walking in a great deal of faith. When you open your Bible app and you had that thing that was that daily Bible reading plan and you look at it and it's 30 days in the past. Come on, Jesus. There's no shame. Just get right back on it. Maybe get some friends to help you be accountable. Like us as men, there's a few of us that every morning we're in a text group and we read the Bible together and then we text a little comment about it. And then what happens is we notice if maybe somebody hasn't been reading for a few days and we'll lovingly call them out like, hey, where you been at? Right? What's going on? Oh, I was busy. Okay, it's okay to get busy. We're not talking about guilting people into reading, right? It should become a desire of our heart that you can't get by just like you can't, you know, not eat, right? For a long period of time. Like, man, I need to eat the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So maybe you're not great at uh, reading it. You could listen to it. The Bible apps all will read it to you nowadays, right? They'll actually help you in that way. So have a consistent plan to be in God's Word. Add to it by doing things like you're doing today, going to church or next week, go sign up and be a part of a small group. Plug in where you could go deeper in your faith with other people. Read the word and bask in the glory of the stories of Jesus and his disciples, where by faith they cast out demons, where by faith they healed the sick, where by faith they healed and delivered and set free. How amazing is that? Read those stories. Let them get deep within you. The New Testament is inundated with story after story. Guess what? It even says this in John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. 
Why have you accepted anything less? How many times have you read that verse? You know, I've read it over the many years in Christianity. I'm like, there's got to be more. This can't be everything. There's got to be more. It says even here, and greater works than these will you do. Lord, something's wrong with modern day Christianity. Why have we bought so many lies? Why don't we believe that you could still do the things that you did in the Bible? Why can't we believe that when we walk in because your presence is within us, that people will be healed, that people will be delivered, that demons will flee, that people will be set free? Why do we accept that the devil wins? Do you believe his word or don't you? Could it be more plain? I mean, like, Lord, help us. Help us in our unbelief. It says... Greater things than this will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So let me tie the two things together. So first, you have to know God's word. Because when you pray, if your prayers are in accordance with God's word, then they will be answered. Do you hear that? I'm tying the two together real tight. One more time. If you ain't in the word, then guess what? If you're praying for things that don't line up with God's word, then he probably ain't going to answer your prayer or the he answers it. The answer is (laughs) no, right? So if you want to pray prayers that prevail, if you want to pray prayers that send the demons fleeing, then you got to pray them in accordance with God's word, which is deep within your heart. But there was a second condition I put up there. You got to actually pray. Some of us be like a situation comes up and you're quick to get on the phone with your girlfriend and talk about the situation. We're quick to go out there and yell about our boss or be discouraged about whatever situation we find ourselves in. We hear the report from the doctor and our first reaction is fear, not prayer. Lord, would you help us in our unbelief? Lord, help us. Would today be a day that we would overcome? Would today be a day that we begin to believe at a greater level? And then you could supercharge that by fasting. Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting, right? So if you want to see these things happen, we got to return to the old school stuff. We got to be a people of the word. We got to be a people of prayer. We got to be a people of fasting. We got to be a people in God's presence, right? Would you prioritize those things in your schedule and then watch what God begins to do as he activates your faith? Would you rise with me and bow your heads, close your eyes? In conclusion, faith is built through the study of God's word, the seeds getting used and sprouting and activated by speaking out in faith. You know, demons can't read your minds. You got to call them out. Sickness needs to be cast out by the spoken word of God. Multiplied in prayer as we fast and multiplied in the presence of other believers. It says when two or more are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them and anything they pray, man, God will answer. So if you're here today, the first thing I want to ask you is have you surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you prayed the kind of prayer that I did earlier where I said, Jesus, man, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life in you. If you've never prayed that prayer, I would love to join you in praying that prayer today. Or maybe you are a believer and you've strayed for some time and today's the day you're just like, man, I am ready to come home. Lord, would you forgive me? I repent. I've been walking in another way, and today I know I need to come back to you. There's nothing wrong with coming back to Jesus. If that's you, would you do me a big, bold favor and just raise your hand wherever you're at if you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lord today? Is there anyone in here today? Raise it up high so I could see it. I see your hand, sir. Come on, Jesus. Are there others in here? Over here as well. There's a hand over here. Hey, if you did that, I want to ask you to be bold. If you raised your hand, I'm going to meet you down here in a second. If you raised your hand, there's others that are going to join you. If you raised your hand, would you come on up here to the front? One of your friends around you just bring you up here real quick. Give them a big round of applause. Come on up right now. Thank you, Lord. Here's something that I'm going to ask everybody to do today. 
you know, one of the things that we got to get really good about is inviting people that don't know Jesus to come. The prerequisite for miraculous faith is saving faith, right? We need to be a people who prioritize seeing others come to know Jesus. I'm going to ask you if you would do me a big favor. If there's someone in your life that you're believing for and interceding for and you want to see God break through for them today, that they would get saved, that God would give them the gift of saving faith, would you come out of your seats and join me up here at the front? If you were believing for somebody, would you please join me up here today? Anyone that's praying for someone else to come to know Jesus, join those that are up here as well. There's two more groups I want to pray for today. Stay, come on up. Give them a little bit of room to come on up. If you are struggling with a stronghold, whether you're here at the front or whether you're there and you haven't come out of your seats, that stronghold could be a variety of things. Pastor Adam talked about repentance. Pastor Adam and I both talked about holiness today, right? If you're struggling in some area that you just can't overcome on your own, man, I want to pray for you today. If that's you, would you just be bold enough to raise your hand wherever you find yourself? You're struggling in some area of your life. Just put your hand up really high if that's you. I see yours and yours. If you're struggling, just come on up to the front as well. Come on up. And the last one, whether you stay where you're at, or whether you come to the front. Like I shared for those who are believing for salvation for someone else today, I reversed that same question. Is somebody you love struggling with maybe addiction today? Is somebody you love struggling with some other stronghold? Maybe it's pornography or a relationship that they're not supposed to be in. Maybe it's anger, whatever that might be that you believe could have demonic influences as part of that. Would you do me a favor and raise your hand right where you're at and or come to the front? I see hands all over the place. Let's break some strongholds in this place today.